Hello again, I'm Frank Gallard from RadioPedia.org. In this, our sixth episode in our Imaging of Stroke series, we'll review hemorrhagic transformation of ischemic stroke. Before we begin, let's have a look at three cases. Which of these do you think represents hemorrhagic transformation of a stroke? By the end of this episode, you should be able to make the distinction with confidence. In episode four of the series, we saw a natural progression of bland ischemic stroke from the earliest signs, such as hyperdense artery, all the way through to encephalomalacia. Hemorrhagic transformation is usually seen in the first four days following infarction, but is rare in the first six hours. Hemorrhagic transformation in one form or another is seen in over half of all infarcts, although the reported rates vary widely depending on definition and modality. Two distinct processes fall under this term. These are particular hemorrhage and secondary hematoma. As we will see, they not only appear different, but have different prognostic implications. As such, it is important in reports to ensure that when hemorrhagic transformation is present, one clearly distinguishes between the two. Let's first discuss petechial hemorrhages. Petechial hemorrhages, which pathologists refer to as red softening macroscopically, account for the vast majority of cases with hemorrhagic transformation and result in increased attenuation of the affected brain. In this case, a CT obtained acutely does not convincingly demonstrate change but a follow-up study two weeks later demonstrates increased attenuation of the cortex. This appearance and timing could represent fogging phenomenon we discussed in episode 5, which typically occurs two to three weeks after infarction. If, however, we review an MRI obtained one day after onset of symptoms, after TPA was administered, we can see a large infarct and gyriform susceptibility-induced signal dropout consistent with particular hemorrhagic transformation, which typically occurs within a day of thrombolysis. In this second case, a large right middle cerebral artery infarct is again not clearly visible on the initial scan, although minor blurring of the grey-white matter interface is present. The next day on MRI, the infarct is easily seen on DWI, and the echoplanar imaging signal loss is seen in the lentiform nucleus, again consistent with particular hemorrhagic transformation. Two days later still, this region demonstrates increased attenuation on CT. Particular hemorrhages result from small amounts of blood seeping out of vessels damaged by ischemia into nearby tissues. They do not have mass effects and generally do not impact on prognosis or treatment. Now on to the far more sinister secondary hematoma. As we have seen, the vast majority of ischemic strokes without interventions undergo progression which does not include secondary hematoma formation. A small minority, say 5%, will however spontaneously hemorrhage and only a subset of these are symptomatic. This is easy to understand when you look at this case. The hematomas are relatively small and embedded in brain that is already infarcted, and thus no symptoms arise from these hematomas. The cause of hemorrhagic transformation is thought to be due in the majority of cases to early reperfusion of infarcted tissue. The damaged vessels are unable to withstand arterial pressures and rupture. Collateral flow is also implicated in some patients as secondary hematoma can be seen in patients without recanalization. The rate is significantly higher when reperfusion therapy is employed, such as intravenous or intraarterial thrombolysis or clot retrieval. The rate of symptomatic secondary hematoma formation in these patients is variably reported, but is up to 6% in those treated with IV TPA. The importance of hemorrhagic transformation with hematoma formation is that it is associated with a much poorer outcome. This is particularly troublesome in the context of active reperfusion therapy, as in the process of trying to improve outcome, one can inadvertently make the patient much worse. As a result, a great deal of research into acute stroke management has been focused on trying to accurately select the subgroup of patients who will get the most benefit from therapy and are at the lowest risk of hemorrhagic transformation. We will cover this in some detail in our final episode in this series. Secondary hematomas tend to occur spontaneously within the first four days after infarction, but are rare in the first six hours, and typically occur within a day after reperfusion therapy. In most cases, the diagnosis is obvious. The fact that the patient had a previous ischemic stroke is either written on the request card or is evident from the CT scan, as is the case here, where a day earlier the patient had a hyperdense MCA sign, a distal M1 occlusion, and a perfusion defect. Some difficulty can occur when the first study is obtained sometime after onset of symptoms, at which time hemorrhage is already present. If this was the first CT you had available to you, one needs to decide whether this represents low bar hemorrhage or hemorrhagic transformation. 
Although this is a straightforward example, it illustrates many of the features typical of secondary hematomas. There is nothing particular about the hematomas themselves, although they are usually multifocal. The key to the diagnosis is the surrounding brain. In most cases, one can see evidence of an established but non-hemorrhagic component, which conforms to an expected vascular territory. The cortex is involved as well as the white matter, indicating cytotoxic rather than vasogenic edema. So looking at our three cases, you can see that case A has these features. There is a region of cytotoxic edema involving most of the MCA territory but sparing the PCA territory. Hemorrhage accounts for only part of the abnormality. Case B has a large hematoma with only a small amount of vasogenic edema surrounding it. It also seems to involve both the MCA and ACA territory but no abnormality of the rest of the MCA territory is visible. This represents a primary low bar hemorrhage. Case C is a small circumscribed mass with only some vasogenic edema seen in the adjacent white matter. The adjacent cortex is normal in appearance. This represents a hemorrhagic metastasis. You can, of course, find out much more about hemorrhagic transformation on radiopedia.org.